Well, that's because Disneyland is lo located physically at the uh, north latitude of uh, 33, specifically 33, I believe, 0 0.1881. And this is a latitude that, uh, as the book um, points out, where a lot of interesting things exist or have occurred. Mm -hmm. um, there, there's a zone between 30 and 40 degrees latitude north that um, you know, you'll find a lot of interesting things in places. But 33 specifically has a few uh, um, you know, interesting associations. Um, Dallas, of course, the site of the JFK assassination, mm -hmm. is uh, roughly there at latitude 33. And if you're familiar with the um, essay King Kill 33, you'll know all about the uh, esoteric associations with that right. assassination. Um, on on a lighter note, there's you know there's interesting uh, architectural things um, and and just you know the, the the book says it's been a while since I um, wrote that book a few years so right. I'm rusty on. Uh, on, on the smaller details, you'll hear me refer to the book. <laughs> well, I mean, I've heard that um, the Bermuda Triangle touches on that uh, latitude. Yeah. Uh, Roswell touches on that latitude. Uh, yes. So there are some interesting, uh, some interesting things there. I mean, I live in San Diego. A lot of the book is about Southern California, um, of course, mm -hmm. as it is about Disneyland. And I live right around the corner. The closest bar to my house is actually called Latitudes, and it's uh, the 32nd degree, which is kind of close. But now, what do people need to know about uh, the idea of unified fields and the energy grid? Uh, what causes uh, an attraction to this parallel? I mean, it is unified fields and uh, the idea of ley lines. But what do they need to know about it before we get into their use at Disneyland? Well, I would say that the, the, the reason that um, people and builders and such are drawn to this zone, this latitude, is because um, it, it's a very practical consideration. I, you know, you find you know um, nice, evenly temperate zones there that um, you know are good for agriculture, are very you know more pleasant living conditions, that kind of thing. So that's a very practical, common sense um, reason for people to be drawn there. But mm -hmm. of course, the energy that I is there uh, contributes to this state. Um, uh, specifically, and there's energy all over the planet, but because of um, the fact that you know the the the, the warmer you get, uh, people tend to um, associate that with comfort. Mm -hmm. um, now, of course, there's the really hot zones where that's not comfortable, and and the the latitude of 33 tends to be in the zone that's you know um, comfortably between the colder and the hotter zone. So yeah. so it's a common sense thing. I, I'm assuming your listeners, you know, are used to the concept of the planetary grid. Um, right. So, you know, basically it's the, the grid of energy that runs physically through the planet, um, which I like to identify with telluric current, popularly called ley lines. Mm -hmm. um, and this is something that engineers are aware of. And engin different engineers take advantage of it in different ways. Mm-hmm. This is, uh, it seems like it's been known about for a long time. A lot of people bring up the idea of ley lines and energy grids when talking about like lost knowledge or ancient technologies. Do you think there was a, a time when these nodes on the grid were harnessed more regularly? Like, aren't a lot of ruins and structures on these uh, cross sections? Yes, uh, you do find ancient ruins, ancient structures. Um, uh, conspicuously located where uh, these energy um, lines and energy nodes are, so it would it, it strongly suggests that this was a much more um, uh, commonly known uh, uh, what's the word phenomenon, you know, yeah. physical phenomenon, and uh, used in in ways a little more overtly than today. Um, as the book goes into it. I believe, um, if I recall right, that book, because uh, my, my book right after it gets into it a little more, mm -hmm. um, uh, the, the builders of the telegraphy system, the old telegraph system of the Old West, and you know, the 19th century thing, they were very much aware of this, and they actually tapped um, systems of telegraphy into 
this uh, this ground energy because it's an ELF, an extremely low frequency current, mm -hmm. and it would boost. Um, you know, they would post their telephone, uh, excuse me, their telegraph lines along these uh, lines where, you know, and, and they have their methods of knowing where they were at, finding where they were at. But you also find um, where engineers place uh, hospitals and uh, airports and military bases and radio stations mm -hmm. because they're aware that this, this natural telluric current um, can boost the various uh, processes involved in those types of um, in, in structures and, and, and I, institutions is mm -hmm. the word I'm looking for. It, well, it, it assists in healing, it, it boosts communication, um, you know, and all, all these things. Railroad lines also um, have a tendency to be built um, along these lines, Railroad, the physical railroad tracks and such. Yeah. And it is it is odd that it does seem part of that uh, hidden knowledge, you know, in the conspiracy realm. My my gentleman who does the geomorphology, so to speak, um, if that's what we call it, what he does, um, he considers it an open secret amongst um, engineers. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just something that the public finds hocus pocus because they're generally not aware of it, and then when they find out about it, it just sounds like magic, which. You know, Arthur C. Clarke said any sufficiently advanced technology would seem like magic, and that's what this is. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned uh, military bases was actually my next question, because you've worked with the military and government for a long time, and I've heard it suggested mm -hmm. that, uh, you know, the U.S. places their bases on this grid, and some of the wilder stories are that they do this so they can control and lock down the occasional multidimensional portal that opens up along these lines on the Earth. Have you heard of that at all? What are your thoughts on that? I've I've heard of it, and my opinion is if, if anybody's going to have any kind of control to access these things, um, it makes sense that it would be, you know, th that the military would be involved in that. So, sure, I mean, that makes logical sense. Um, mm -hmm. Whether we can prove that or not is a, is a different issue, but um, that, that does make logical sense to me that they would and they do. I've heard that idea used to explain the presence of Bigfoot, the Loch Ness Monster, you know, flying saucers and ghosts. Uh, I mean, mm -hmm. even, I know you're familiar with Nick Redfern. I just had him on recently. His most recent book is The World's Weirdest Places. It's kind of along the same lines as that there are weird places that attract a uh, strange phenomenon. Yeah, I'm, I'm in agreement with you. There's something to that. Well, where would you suggest, because... I I love the paranormal. I love uh, the conspiracy world and all the mystery around it. But I've never had much of a personal experience. And if there were a place to go to, uh, you know, increase the chances of that, I mean, would you have a suggestion? Oh yeah, there's any number. But my first question would be: um, Are you do do you feel you are? Do you think you are truly prepared for it? Because I'll tell you, um, mm -hmm. it's. I, I don't like to call it a Pandora's box, right? But you know, it's similar in idea because once you uh, walk through or open certain doorways, um, there's really no turning it off 100%. Mm -hmm. So you have to really think about that. Um, these are the kinds of things that can uh, separate you from others in the day-to-day -day experience of life that is in true. reality. Um, you know, not that things are going to be floating around your head constantly. Um, you know, the presence is m most of the time a lot more subtle than that, but it does change your perspective on what reality is. It changes your, your values in some cases, and um, it can, you know, it can... Uh, this has not happened to me, but it can potentially, you know, it can end friendships, it can affect... Mm -hmm. You know, um, close relationships, that kind of thing. Um, you know, it, it has affected mine to the extent of I know who amongst my friends and family that I can talk about certain things and who I cannot. Right. Because they can't handle certain things or, you know, they, they just don't want to accept it. So you have to be prepared. You have to consider all of that before you would go looking for these things. At times, it'll it'll be a handful, but uh, you're in the San Diego area. You Correct. said where specifically? 
uh, Pacific Beach. Oh, you're at PB. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, well, I would recommend spending time. Do you spend much time in Balboa Park? You know, I, I've been there, yeah. I, I know Balboa Park pretty well. Spend more time there. Yeah. Um, and also pay a visit to pay a visit to the uh, Cabrillo Monument on Point Loma whenever you get a chance. Yeah, there's some and, anomalous uh, stories going on over there. Um, my current research um, and some of the stuff I talk about in my book after Latitude 33, Empire of the Wheel, uh, gets into that a little bit. But since you're there, and, and I, I would recommend um, spending more time in Balboa Park, you know, go over there and pay the occasional visit to the Cabrillo Monument. Um, you're not going to see anything overt, but uh, these are places where the energy flows very strongly. And this is one of those things where it's essentially the more exposure you get, the, the more exposure you get, mm -hmm. if you catch my meaning. Um, yeah. And, and it's, it takes a little time for things to, I guess I'll use the word manifest. Right. Uh, that's really the best, the best word. You know, I would say I'm pretty ready for an experience. I mean, of course, you know, you can, you can say that uh, uh -huh. as many times as you want. <laughs> yes, you but can. I've uh, I've had some strange experiences with psychedelics. You know, I've tried to uh, induce it that way. Um, but ah, I'm... you're wasting. You know, and I'm not saying you're wasting your time when you do that, but that's artificial. You think um, so? Oh have, yeah, have yeah, it's artificial. A, have you had a serious psychedelic experience? Uh, no, I've never needed to. From the time I was uh, a, a a young kid and the time I was a teenager when I had an enlightenment experience. I've never needed, well, let me put it this way. I've never needed substances to have a psychedelic experience. And that's, that's a fair point, and I have friends like that as well. But, and I did question the validity of the experience before I had it, um, but post-experience, I feel like it's kind of trying to explain the color green to a blind man. You know, it's like, it is pretty, uh, pretty realistic. I, I would equate it to, you know, I have friends who meditate and wade into the waters, and uh, a good mm -hmm. psychedelic trip is like diving off the high dive. Uh, but to get back to the book, Latitude 33, the idea of ley lines and the energy, um, another thing that uh, happened recently, right before I started reading your book, I was watching an alternative documentary on the Nazis and their sort of fringe science, you know, involving earth harmonics and stuff like that. And in your book, you touch on that a bit too, mainly on uh, the Nazi bell. What can you tell people about the stories of the bell? Well, I can't tell it as good as Igor Krakowski or Joseph Farrell, but the basics are that uh, starting as early as the 1920s, the, the Nazi scientists, the German scientists during that era, um, were beginning to work on uh, the, the principles of this device that um, was known as the bell, and um, they were they went into it looking for alternative propulsion systems for aircraft and potentially spacecraft. And what they discovered was a much more um, comprehensive uh, te technological potential or technology, mm -hmm. say. And it was actually, uh, my understanding is that it was based on, um, you know, the ancient uh, Vimana technology essentially, or, or they were messing with the same things, mm -hmm. in which uh, it was a rotating device, um, one part fit inside the other, and it counter-rotated, and there was a layer of um, a, a, a special mercury um, compound, liquid, that was pumped in between the two layers, and the combination of the counter-rotation and this mercury created fields, and uh, these fields affected um, uh, the, 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 the physical, um, what's the word, the, 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 it affected uh, physical objects on the atomic mm -hmm. level. Um, it caused great destruction. Uh, it was responsible for the deaths of technicians. But it also had an effect on time-space. And so you can imagine all the theories you know, abound as to what this thing was and could do. Some people say it, it uh, explains, you know, the, uh, the, the modern flying saucer era. 
Um, others say, you know, it was a time machine, and it could very well have been both. And mm -hmm. like I said, uh, Mr. Kukowski and, of course, Joseph Farrell, uh, they they write about it in greater detail and, and do greater justice to it than I do. But um, it uh, it's it's along the lines of these ancient technologies that have been lost. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it seems like this knowledge and use of this energy isn't really that rare. It's just a bit underground. And, you know, it was at this point in my thought process when I was speculating based on the persistent rumor that Walt Disney was a 33 degree Mason, that it might be called the 33 degree because that's when they present you with the hidden knowledge of ley lines and the power of the 33rd degree. But you've looked into the idea that Walt was a Mason and uh, right. sadly it seems to have no basis despite a convenient similarity to the number 33, right? Yeah, that's <laughs> and, and Walt Disney being a Mason is a persistent rumor that um, you know, I, I, I personally try to put to rest because um, being a, a Mason myself, you know, I contacted. Oh, yeah? Yeah, I'm, a, I'm just a third degree Blue Lodge Mason, as they call it. And, um, you know, I, I, I said, well, heck, that's easy. Let's call some of the, uh, you know, the state lodges, whatever. And I checked two or three Masonic sources. They came back and said, no, Walt Disney was never a Mason never raised in a lodge, nothing. He had been in, involved in de Malay when he was a teenager. Well, de Malay, of course, is it, it, it's, it's the youth organization of Freemasonry, but a lot of kids, a lot of young men were in de Malay um, that never really went on to become Masons. It was just mm -hmm. kind of like uh, um, being in, you know, like if Kiwanis, I, I think they have something called the Key Club, for high school age and, and stuff, you know, a lot of these uh, various uh, fraternal orders that are, you know, business and social orders and stuff, they have these. And, you know, um, they just do good deeds for the public uh, when they're kids, that kind of thing. And, and Disney was that, but he never went on to be a Freemason. And yet that rumor persists based on nothing more than people keep saying it. So mm -hmm. I try to do my part to, to point out. <laughs> Now let me ask you: Is it easy to find out, like, who, if 33 degree is the highest level, or at least the highest public level, to my understanding, is it easy to find out who's on that list? Well, if you have a a lodge, um, you know, a, a Scottish Rite lodge, because uh, the degrees that high are the Scottish Rite, if they're willing to, you know, if you're asking about a famous person. Yeah, I, I see where if you call them and, and there's an individual who, um, you know, you're asking about, they're mm -hmm. very likely to tell you, oh, yes, absolutely, member of this lodge, you know, um, it, it achieved the uh, 32nd degree and then went on to get 30. Not a whole lot of people become 33rd degree. It's, right. it's often a posthumous thing. So. Is are these societies, uh, the Mason Society, Scottish Rite, are these the things, like, do you think that uh, they hold some uh, hidden knowledge that they release to you as you go up the ranks? Or, you know, what is the point of going from a 32nd to 33rd degree? Well, you got to remember, um, these organizations have a twofold um, existence. Mm -hmm. Primarily, they are... Um, philanthropic organizations. It's it's a it's a way for you know businessmen and um, or, or civic leaders to get together and uh, get to know each other, socialize and network. But as a group, they sincerely and genuinely do you know good deeds for the community. It's it's their way of. And what I like about it is, I would rather these organizations do um, good things for the welfare of their fellow man than the government do it. The government can't sustain that. Um, That's true. But, but these organizations are often made up of wealthy, successful uh, men, and you know they're 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 generous enough and uh, philanthropical enough that you know they want to help the needy. And, and that's what these organizations, the Shriners Hospital is, is renowned for being a great hospital for children, and their, their burn center is, is legendary. So, you know, they do great things. Now, within an organization like that, just like within our everyday society or any, you know, any neighborhood in America, you're going to have some people that are interested in the more arcane aspects, and it, 
you know, therefore, it uh, it serves that purpose for those who are interested in that. That's so, what I'm interested in, yeah. That's what seems to be most fascinating about it, because it seems like maybe the way it looks to me as an outsider and a bit of a conspiracy theorist is uh, up until a certain point, it's about that business relationship, but then you know, you'll have these guys who seek out those who are interested in that arcane and they'll say, okay, you're, you're ready to come up a level. You're up, you know, you, let's go behind this closed door. And, uh, yeah, and if, you know, if you use basic common sense and logic, you can see how that would work. Is, mm -hmm. You know, you have a lodge and you have all the guys having their coffee cake and uh, having some beers together and they, they help the widows and orphans. And then you, you've got the guys higher up that are interested in this stuff, and they're watching, and they're seeing, just like you spelled out, they would see, you know, who is more suited to this knowledge. And, yeah, they would be vetted and, and recruited into that knowledge um, in that way. That's, that's logically how mm -hmm. it would work. And I guess another, another argument that a lot of conspiracy theorists would make is that almost that those lower levels are pawns to the higher levels because they're creating the philanthropic front that covers up the the real damage they're doing at a higher level in secrecy. And that's debatable, but... Yeah, uh, if, 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 you, if you believe that these guys are the, uh, the evil uh, masterminds behind <laughs> this stuff, you, here's one thing you have to remember. A, a lot of people in the public don't know this, but when you become a Mason, you learn that um, we have a thing where... It, it, it's it's just part of our 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 thing. Um, we don't defend ourselves publicly. We mm -hmm. let people say whatever they want to say, and we do not defend ourselves publicly. No matter how heinous it is in masonry, you just you just let people who don't know essentially don't know what they're talking about run their mouths and say whatever they want, and you you just you you don't openly defend yourself because throughout time, you know, Masonic lodges have had to go underground, and then they, you know, are public. We're, we've been in a public phase for a while, mm -hmm. um, greatly, you know, because, you know, here in the States, politically things were different, but, you know, over in the old world, in Europe, when you had the uh, Vatican with all its power, you know, if you, if you want to look at an organization that's being a mastermind behind yeah. certain things, as we know, we got to look at the Vatican also, and, mm -hmm. and it's legendary how much, you know, historically the church has hated masonry. They used to excommunicate mm -hmm. um, just on, you know, if a, if a Catholic man joined a lodge, he was excommunicated. Um, so uh, a lot of, and what a lot of people don't know is the material that a lot of our present-day conspiracies are based on, this is stuff that was made up out of whole cloth by the Vatican back in the 19th century just to... Um, uh, just to slander masonry, mm -hmm. um, just what is stuff that wasn't true because they didn't want their males joining the lodges. Yeah, you know, there doesn't out. seem to be anything innately wrong with, you know, knowing about archaic symbolism and ley lines uh, and principles of engineering that are inherent to the earth, you know, the sacred geometry kind of thing. Doesn't seem to be anything wrong with that necessarily, but I think where people get uh, paranoid is that uh, archaic symbolism uh, is is uh, affecting you know you on a subconscious level that you're you're getting into the realm of uh, of mind control almost. You're right on that line. Uh, well, at least that's if, the perception. Well, there, and there you go. There's a perception, and um, uh, you know I was in a profession where. Um, let me put it to you this way. A, a phrase that I absolutely despise that people love to use is perception is reality. Ha <laughs> ha, bullshit. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, in my profession, perception was usually a mask created by somebody who was hiding something. Yes. And that, that, that's what I discovered is perception isn't always reality, and, and people need to remind themselves that. But um, going back to perception of Masons, what if the application of these symbols, what if the manipulation of um, the public consciousness through the Masonic symbols and, or, or the Masonic use of symbols, what if that wasn't so much a manipulation or a control as it was an enlightenment? What if the right. presence of symbols, uh, when, when you walk around you know, doing your, your daily business in a city that's full of these symbols, 
what if those are symbols that mean something to the subconscious and actually are keys to unlocking the, the subconscious and giving you more awareness? And this, I argue, and I'm not the only one, but this, I argue, is why organizations like the Vatican Powers and, and other true tyrants are against masonry because they know that these things free the individual, and that's what they're scared of. We, and we live in an era right now that preaches the collective. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I'm telling you, that is dangerous. That's who you've got to worry about, are the collectivists. Masonry has always been about the enlightenment of the individual, when you really dig into it and, and really know what you're talking about with masonry. And when Freemasons put these things out in the public, it's not to control you. It's not to uh, uh, hypnotize you into a zombie state. It's quite the opposite. It is designed and it's intended to open your consciousness and, and, and make you more aware. And what that does is that sets you free, so to speak. That's an interesting perspective, and I, I don't necessarily disagree with it, but I guess people would say, well, then why the secrecy? But then you'd have to say, well, because there's a lot of knowledge here, and if you don't know it, it's not going to benefit you. Um, well, I'll tell you why the secrecy. It's just the same reason why I quit talking about certain personal experiences in interviews and, and in my books. I realized why, uh, and, and, I'm, and I don't want anyone to get offended, but this is the best um, phrase to put it. You know, you get tired of casting your pearls before swine. And what I mean by that is, you know, I, speaking for myself, I go down a certain path, I dig things out, I learn certain truths and facts, I have certain experiences. And like we were talking earlier, there's no way in hell that just my describing it to you, your reading my words of, of my description of my experience, is going to convey the full uh, a comprehensive impact of that experience. You've got to have the experience yourself. So therefore, the secrecy is more a camaraderie between actual experiencers who understand this. The at, what I've come to learn is um, not everybody has a right to know mm -hmm. about all this yeah. that it, unless they go and earn it. They do have, it, it's there, it's, it's out there for them to, they have a right to it but they have to earn it. They don't have a right for somebody who else who has it to just give it to them. And I'm not about to, you know, uh, uh, just give things to people. I would rather see them earn it, dig it out themselves, because they'll get more out of it. It's better for them. And, and I think that's what the part of the secrecy is about. The other part of the secrecy is a very practical thing. You have to remember, during times of tyranny, Masonic lodges are condemned. And so these guys have to operate under the surface, and that's how you know who's a true member or, or who is maybe an infiltrator, you know, from mm -hmm. the bad guys speak. So it, it, it has a practical application, and it's, you know, it's not as sinister as people think. It's sinister as hell to collectivist-minded people, of course, you know, because they don't, like true, they don't like true individuality. So it scares the hell out of them. Fair. Um yeah, I mean, it, not to get on a whole another tangent, but uh, it seems like there's also a collectivist move. There's there's both the people who are afraid of the new world order and the one world government, but then also, uh, you know, I see that among the enlightened, there's also another movement that that eventually we will have to evolve into, you know, a global society. When you see, at least in the stereotypical sci-fi way, beings from another planet, they've got to operate as a unit and get that all sorted out before they can really graduate to uh, a place of real global prosperity. And I'd say there's probably something to that as well. I, I, I see that. I have come to see that more as mythology. As yeah. I see that as the wet dream of the people who are true globalists, and, and they want people who are suspicious of globalism to believe in that. Um, here, here, here's the way I see it. As technology allows... You're going to have people who think like me. They're going to say, "No, the, this this evils of collectivism with, with globalism, with this global community comes some really bad things." Uh, no, thank you. We don't want to participate. And when the technology allows, just as people who think more freely um, got in ships and crossed oceans, these same kind of people are going to get in ships and cross uh, the, the the seas of space and mm -hmm. just go to other worlds. Um, and, uh, you know, I, in a way, I, I wish there was that opportunity now. Yeah. 
Um, that would be interesting. Yeah, and, and so you're always going to have free thinkers who see the evils of globalism and see it for what it really is and, and understand why that's not such a peachy idea. Right. Um, corruption is everywhere, and the concentration of power only uh, makes it easier for corruption to get a serious foothold. But let's there you uh, go. Let's bring this back to uh, to the book and, and Disneyland. We talked about the masonry. We talked, you know, Walt Disney was not a mason. So if there if there was some uh, you know some knowledge there to be had to place Disney mm -hmm. in Anaheim on the cross section of these ley lines for a reason, where did this knowledge come from if it didn't come from Walt Disney? Well, as the book goes into and introduces the reader, um, there was a gentleman named C.V. Wood who was an engineer for the Stanford Research Institute, the legendary mm -hmm. SRI, who was involved in a lot of interesting technology in the mid-20th century. And, and scientific remote viewing is the biggest one. Um, that's, uh, you know, the, the people are um, familiar with uh, the stories of the, the unit that involved that employed uh, Joseph McMonagall and all those guys who um, are, are, are able to, uh, essentially remote viewing is when you can open up your consciousness and um, describe places that are miles away right. um, from your position, thus remote viewing. And um, certain guys, researchers at SRI were involved in the creation and development of uh, the protocols that are used in this remote viewing concept. And um, it, I, that's probably what they're presently most famous for as far as what we would call paranormal. Um, but uh, there, there was a gentleman working there in the 50s, uh, C.V. Wood, who was very interested in psychic phenomena and such things like that. Mm -hmm. And along came the Disney brothers who came to SRI for much more mundane uh, consultation regarding where to place their amusement park. And various locations were considered, but the location in Anaheim was uh, finalized, and C.V. Wood was most involved with that. In fact, C.V. Wood was so enamored of the idea of Disneyland that uh, he left SRI to go work for Walt and Roy as the main engineer um, b building Disneyland. C.V. Wood was the head engineer on the building of the park. Mm -hmm. So to go to Disneyland, the physical layout and, and such, that was all C.V. Wood. Um, he's the one who came up with that, and so therefore, as the book details, um, he's the one who placed the carousel on the intersection of ley lines. He's the one who shaped the park physically, um, placed it, he dug a burrow out of the earth and such. So all the things talked about in the book, as far as Disneyland being a psychotronic device, um, that can be credited to C.V. Wood. Yeah, and now this is where we're really getting into it, because, you know, we most people don't know it was built in a bowl-type mm -hmm. layout, and we talked about the Nazi bell, we've talked about the harmonics and the energies of these ley lines, and it seems like your hypothesis is that the carousel itself is a spinning metal device located on the cross-section of these ley lines in its bowl. This is almost creating an energy bubble, or at least that's the theory, correct? Right, yeah, it, and it doesn't have to be metal, by the way, um, in the case of... Uh, um, you know, this it, it just is a rotating device. Um, you 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 place it uh, in conjunction with that lay energy, and you know theoretically you're going to get these results. Um, you're going to get something that you know it's more than the sum of its parts. And uh, the carousel was placed on the intersection of the three ley lines that are in Fantasyland, and the, the 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 rotation of the carousel draws up the energy from these three lines which is already three times more powerful than if it had been just on a single line. Mm -hmm. And it draws it up, but then also the rotation, the spin, then disperses it throughout the park. It spreads that energy throughout the park. And because the park is dug into a bowl, the energy spreads out. And as it flows out towards the berm of the bowl, it kind of has that effect where then it, it rolls back in on itself. So it does create this bowl of energy that is you know, contained right there in the park. And this energy, what would what would you say the effects of this energy 
could be. Are they, and they seem to be, at least, I've been to Disneyland recently, and of course, uh, this effect is no longer in place. Right. Uh, uh, I, I believe the, um, the device was disengaged in 1982 when they redesigned Fantasyland because they moved the carousel several feet. So the device has been disengaged, and, and that I uh, attribute to why the park is really in some ways a shadow of its former self. Mm -hmm. um, I, uh, there's several people, that um, young folks, who never got to experience Disneyland prior to 1982, and, and I tell you, they have not truly experienced what the, um, what the device did. Um, it, it, you would go to Disneyland, and it was like going to Vegas, where there's no windows in the casinos and there's no clocks, if you'll notice. They, mm -hmm. they don't want you to know what, they just want you to get lost in the experience and stay in there all day. Right. Um, the Disneyland was, was a very similar experience. You'd go in there and you would literally forget that you were in the middle of Anaheim, California. Um, and, and you would just get lost in this, this world and just, you know, having fun. I mean, you knew you were in an amusement park, but right. it was not quite like any other. And, um, I theorize, I present the, the idea in the book, the evidence that that was a result, um, that, and, and that was the intended result, I, I'm convinced, of this device, was just to enhance the personal uh, experience of being at the park, mm -hmm. a totally benign um, uh, goal, objective. And uh, so at the very least, you've got that. As, as the reason why this was built and what its intention was. Now, on the other end, depending upon how receptive you are as an individual, psychically and such, um, the, the experience can be quite, quite esoteric, so to speak. It can, it can manifest things beyond just a good feeling, as I experienced, and the book goes into greater detail on. And is there a, besides your personal experience, is there a, a rich history of that type of thing occurring at Disneyland? Well, we know that there are stories of ghosts, um, and as the book uh, puts it, um, you know, and you mentioned earlier, these things, places could be doorways, maybe, you know, that it opens mm -hmm. doorways, this technology. Now, after I, you know, my book got out there, I've had some people contact me, indeed saying that they had had some similar experiences. And, um, you know, in talking with these people, you know, they, you can pick out the ones that are just bandwagoners and the ones that are, you know, sincerely, you know, have had these experiences. Um, and it, it, so, so, yes, I would say based mm -hmm. on that, there are people that have been having experiences. And, again, the cutoff is 1982. Um, with the device disengaged in 82, the, what I'm talking about, you know, it, it, it's kind of sad. It, it, yeah, it can't happen. Right. You know, now, whether Today, they it's did just it on... pure capitalism. It is a soulless place. Uh, it's just a oh, you're right. thin gloss of paint. To... And, and I well, and, and I'm not. I'm a capitalist myself. I'm. I don't think business is evil, but I do mm -hmm. think that um, they, you know, what they've done is. Every new attraction has to be tied in with a product. You know, Walt didn't always do that. Um, in the old days at Disneyland, not every attraction, it might have been tied into a sponsor, but that's how he got the place built. See, people mm -hmm. don't realize that. You know, some people that would be critics of the place, they would go to Disneyland in the old days, and it was the General Electric Carousel of Progress. Well, it, it wasn't just, you know, hey, let's build something to sell GE appliances. Walt and Roy... Uh, and, and this was C.B. Wood's idea, by the way. Mm -hmm. um, he got Walt and Roy to, to go to General Electric and say, we need X number of dollars to build this really cool attraction. And GE said, oh, okay, that's cool. And, and, and the Disney said, and you can put your, your company name on it. We don't care. That's, and, and you can showcase your future technology. Same with Atlantic Richfield, which we now know as Arco. They went to them and said, look, we want to build this thing called Autopia. It's a fun car ride. And and, you know, would you guys pay for that attraction? And they said, yeah, we'll, we'll invest in that attraction, sure, and you can put your name on it. So it was the Richfield, uh, you know, sponsored Autopia. So this was not an, an evil, sinister, you know, conspiratorial thing they were doing with, with these companies. But um, so to me, that's the positive example of, you know, that was not an evil capitalist thing. That was mm -hmm. a good capitalist thing in that case. But I totally agree with you now 
you know, everything in there has to be, you know, pushing some product. Right. For instance, a marine voyage, they didn't need to make that the Finding Nemo ride. Walt didn't have the submarine voyage tied to any of his movies, and he could have had it tied to 20,000 Leagues like it was at Disney World, but right. he didn't. Um, but, you know, the guys in, you know, in control in recent years – it has to be, it's got to be selling and pushing something. And you can see it and you can feel it in the park that it's just not what it used to be. And it's way too expensive to be yes. worth going. And in there, they're ruining the park. I agree that it is not, it doesn't seem special. Um, you know, there is a tendency for people to remember the good old days. But I think that really does apply to Disneyland. And I guess you would suggest it was the moving of this device, the carousel, from the ley lines that uh, maybe you know, put it on that path of losing its magic? Yeah, see, the whole park is the device itself, and the carousel is the, is the uh, uh, operative piece that makes it all work. And if they, it, I, I argue that if they moved the carousel back to its original position, that um, the device would become operative again. It might start affecting and, the consciousness in a more, I guess, slightly euphoric, more positive way, more enlightening way. Um, yeah, absolutely. Uh, absolutely. C.B. Wood did this for, for positive reasons, um, and uh, uh, I'm convinced. And this, this, this is a good thing. And, uh, my experience is, uh, you know, people can read in the book. I see that as it was totally a good thing. It was an amazing thing. And um, this was not to, you know, mind screw anybody or turn people into slaves. That, that, that's ridiculous. I mean, think about it that wouldn't have served any purpose. I mean, Walt Disney was an entertainer. He was a showman. Um, he, he wanted people to enjoy his park and come back again and again. And, and you know what? Yeah, maybe he wanted them to be in the mood to buy more popcorn and get a T-shirt or a stuffed animal or something, buy more tickets, buy more rides. You know what? We live in a time where everybody wants to demonize business, and I reject that. Uh, that, that I reject that. That is absolutely ridiculous. And so, you know, um, there's nothing evil about what Walt Disney did. I'll tell you what, the, the so-called dark side of Walt Disney, he smoked like a chimney, you know, he liked to drink a little, and they say he cussed like a sailor. Okay, <laughs> oh gosh, you know, what a rotten guy. I did want to ask you about uh, alchemy and symbolism as it pertains to Disney, because we're really, that's really two distinct topics, because you got Walt Disney... Um, and his vision of the company, and then you got the modern Disney Corporation. And when most people hear uh, Disney conspiracy or symbolism, they think of the Little Mermaid cock castle, whispers of take off your clothes and Aladdin, stuff like that. And I've got yeah. a big interest in those more modern hidden messages and what type of effect, if any, they could really be having. You know, in, in, in my opinion, I, I really I've looked at those situations and I found that you know I've separated the wheat from the chaff. The the stuff that's not true from what is true. And mm -hmm. what I found in, in, in convincingly is that the people that have done that have been, you know, disgruntled uh, employees or smart-ass employees who thought it would be cute because right. of personal issues um, with the company. Um, I, I don't think the guys that, you know, that have been doing the, the, the more negative aspects of running the company – I don't think they're, when I say not smart enough to do some big sinister thing, it's because I don't think they're the kind that care about mm -hmm. these esoteric things and are aware of this. I haven't I, I been think tuned it, in. Yeah, it, it's, just, it's just greed and a particular um, outlook on, on what you know, commerce is supposed to be in, in, in their minds. And it's, but even, you know, I, I don't think there's anything sinister to that. Now, that said... As the book states, I do think that C.V. Wood was somebody who was very much into this stuff, and that's why you find the symbolism around the park. And I'm glad you brought that up because the book goes into that. The mm -hmm. book goes into alchemical symbols that are all over the park, particularly the carousel right. in your fantasy. Detail some of that for us if you, if you can uh, remember. Oh, gosh, yeah. Well, you've got, um, you, you've got the symbols of like the, the keys, on the, sh the like the shields um, that decorate the uh, carousel um, uh, overhang cover thing, um, you know you've got the keys which are a, a, a chemical symbol. 
you know, for, um, gosh, ugh, like I said, it's been a few years since yeah. I wrote it. Forgive me. Well, the symbol that I thought was most interesting was the one that we use today um, to represent, uh, like, uh, medical things with the two snakes swirling around the... The caduceus. The center um, and, and that that energy and, and you know it's interesting you bring that up because that symbol came from the ancient uh, East Indian uh, uh, information where the same ancient writings where the Nazi scientists got their um, information on building the bell and that and the snakes represent the energy spinning right. around you know the central pole which um, which created allowed flight of these ancient vimanas almost and, a representation uh, of a carousel really exactly exactly there, there's that and then there's the um the whole thing about the four treasures of the tuatha de Danaans, and um if i'm pronouncing that properly um i go into that in the book where you know the crown the scepter and and the sword and the the other thing um and that is is right there, you know, associated with the carousel and and around the park. And when you get into the fairy tales, the symbolism of the you know the actual fairy tales, I think everybody by now is aware that the you know our modern day you know the, particularly the stories that Disney um, turned into films had much darker beginnings and origins. Right. And, and Not only and, darker, but they also seem to be less less removed from reality. There seemed to be a little more of a tie to reality in that uh, some of these things like fairies and gnomes uh -huh. and whatnot were beings, uh, cryptozoology beings almost, beings from a parallel universe, parallel dimension. Or, yeah, absolutely, particularly in the case, um, some say, of the Tuafas in, in the Fomori, um, you know, they, uh, they, they disappeared into, you know, another either the underground world or another dimension, sure, you know, or, or maybe into space or whatever um that, that's that's really wild stuff that i think is totally cool um mm -hmm. that involved in the symbolism you find around the park and and in fairy tales in general um one of my favorite things was when i mentioned in the book um that uh, the uh the the gnomes the famous gnomes with the red conical hats yeah mm -hmm. how those hats actually start right. out white and people don't realize that they put these things in their gardens and they put them on commercials for travel, you know, companies and uh, cute little gnomes. But those those red hats start white and they turn red because they're dyed red with the blood of virgins that the gnomes drink out of them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that <laughs> and, was a dark, uh, you a dark know, they, they, tidbit. So next time you see a garden gnome or you see that uh, commercial on TV, you'll think of that. And, uh, you know, so that's just one example of... Um, you know, so these darker aspects we're talking about, but, you know, darker in, in, in the sense that it's not all evil from Satan, it's just darker in that most people aren't consciously aware of these things, and it's scary to them, because with that knowledge uh, comes enlightenment that you can't always control, and that is a tremendous responsibility once you have it. Once you're, you're consciously aware of things, you can walk around in a place like Disneyland and just see it all over the place, whereas other people that aren't aware of it, you know, they're like, huh, what? That just looks like a decoration on the wall to mm -hmm. them. And uh, if the they don't... Code. Yeah, if they're not aware of what it means. And then, of course, some people go, quite frankly, they go apeshit in the wrong direction. Once they learn that something has a second me a, a meaning to it, or they simply learn the meaning of something, they go crazy and think, oh my gosh, the overlords are doing this to, you know, drive us into the new world order. And it's uh, okay, you know, um, I, you know, personally, I've I've kind of had enough of that, but because uh, uh, you know these things don't ever pan out the way the the chicken littles say they're going to, but um, not yet. It's it's, it's, it's interesting, and, and, and C.V. Wood, I believe, built Disneyland to be a psychotronic device, in effect, that would simply, um, if it didn't open people's minds consciously, it would give them, you know, a, it would enhance their good time at a fun place. That's, that's what I really, truly have found his objective to be. Yeah, uh, an altruistic motive, and I, I definitely could see that being possible. And whether these more modern problems in Disney movies or these little subtle messages, whether they're disgruntled employees or not, none of this came about um, until the death of Walt Disney anyway. 
So that's right. And thank you, you for bringing that up. That, yeah, that you, stuff didn't happen while Walt was alive. You can't put you that know, on it, him. Yeah, they, they, they can. In fact, um, you know, I'm, I've been very critical of the Disney company in, in recent times, uh, but I, I make the distinction, that the big fat line between the era when Walt was alive and mm-hmm. after the family uh, members lost control of the company. I blame it on, um, it's, the, uh, it's the Michael Eisner era is when it started. And, and he became during... CEO uh, around what time? Uh, in the 80s, I 80s. think. Yeah, and uh, late 80s or something. It was it was really all the nasty stuff, all the bad stuff that you can honestly say about the Disney company really started and, and went through mostly the, the Michael Eisner era. I mean, he's the guy that had the reins that, um, you know, uh, has made the park um, way more expensive than Walt ever envisioned. He's the guy running the show when, you know, that, that – Here's the thing. You got to understand. How old are you, Greg? I'm 27. You're 27. You're a youngster. I'm 49. Yeah. Okay. Guys like me and Adam, we remember what Disneyland used to be. And you would go to that park, and uh, once it got fully up to speed, um, you'd go to that park, and there was never a dead zone in Disneyland. Every corner you went to, there was something there, and it was well maintained, and it was just, it was just a, even if it was just a pleasant, quiet little back corner where the little motorboat rides used to be, it was always well maintained, it was cleaned, and in recent years, um, uh, Tomorrowland, and I get, a, I talk about this a little bit in the book. Tomorrowland has become like the back room in your grandma's house. You know where just crap is stored and nobody mm-hmm. goes in there. Yeah. It's, it's it's. I see that disgusting. everywhere. And um, I, I, you go to Disneyland now, and I actually see rails that have grime built up on yep. them and paint chipped off. I got to tell you, Greg, never, never was Disneyland ever like that. They would every night clean that place, and and if paint was chipped. It was it was fixed within 12 hours. I mean, you just never saw that. And in the Eisner era, uh, the emphasis was not put on the parks. It was like, ah, eh, to hell with it, you know. And let's crank up the ticket price, and people will still flock. And unfortunately, yeah. and, and they do, you know. Um, but it's way too crowded. It's yes. way too expensive, and uh, it's just not up to par what it it's used sad. to be. And, and yeah, you know. It's sad that uh, that I'll never really be able to experience that, but I guess um, you know to support my my uh, conspiratorial and anti-capitalistic view, I would argue that the the wrong side of business, the wrong type of capitalist, always gets a hold of something and ruins it. And this is a prime example. They often do. Let's say. I would. Yeah. I mean, it often, but the the problem is that. Um, whether it happens gradually over time or, or rapidly, they don't. It never goes back to the way it was. And so you got, you know, you got 500 major companies over the past, you know, 100 years slowly getting taken over by the wrong type of capitalist. And then you have a situation where, uh, like we do today, where the control is out of control. You know, it's way overboard. And and you don't see anyone come along and clean them out. They only clean out the good guy. Well, well that's we live argument. in an era where um, visionaries are um, demonized. Walt that's Disney true. was a visionary, and, and we live in a society where we can't have visionaries. And that's the collectivists are scared to death of the individual who is truly a visionary because that individual can do amazing things that does not serve the collective. Right. Just and, go man a cash register and shut the fuck up. You know, that's yeah, the approach today. You know, Exactly, and 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 so the visionary. Look what's done to Walt Disney. People have to demonize him. Um, may, and and I would argue that the people who demonize him are the ones who basically lack vision and are jealous of people like that. And I mean, we see that all the time. Mm-hmm. You know, the people that are the uh, they stand tall above the crowd, and that's the first blade of grass that has to get mowed down by the Sour jealous uh, mediocre. Ayn Rand wrote about it in Atlas Shrugged. Right. And, um, and, and in her other works, you know, um, it's it's uh, George Orwell wrote about it when, you know, I think it's 1984 where, you know, people are forced to wear, you know, people with good vision are forced to wear glasses that 
you know, bring their vision down to be, you know, everybody's forced to be mediocre because mm-hmm. God forbid we hurt someone's feelings. Um, all, all this, all, all this, you know, let's level the playing field, let's make everybody feel good, um, is seriously damaging human civilization because it's wussifying and wimpifying uh, humankind. And um, let me tell you, that is every bit as sinister as um, anything a corporate guy is doing um, because it, it, the goal of it is to turn everything into a big global new world order where everybody are, everybody's more easily controlled because, you know, the, the people who stand out will be afraid to stand out or they're, they're, if they do, you know, their head gets chopped off. You know, here, here, here's, my, here's my general view. I, I find utopian thinking quaint and, uh, and, and kind of childish. Um, this reality we live in, this world we live in, it is exactly what it is supposed to be. Okay? We, we were never intended to make this a 100% fair and peaceful and wonderful world, this utopia. All we can do, as far as that's concerned, is, is change ourselves. The, the, all, all we can do is work on ourselves. If we work on ourselves, then our environment, I say our social environment, our national environment, our global environment will be better. But too many people want to think that they can make this, this reality we live in a utopia. And I argue it already is exactly what it's supposed to be. And that is when it's tough, when it's harsh, when, when bad things pop up, it's because that's supposed to test our individual character, see? And that's a so fair point. rather than try to change the world, which I might add, you're never going to do. It is a waste of time. People but a visionary go- might say otherwise. Well, yeah, but, you know, okay. <laughs> I'm just um, messing with you, but, and there does seem remember, to be... A- remember, 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 I didn't say you always have to agree with the visionary, what I'm saying is we tend to demonize visionaries. Right. But a, a true you visionary know, would yeah. probably hope for and strive for that utopia. And some good things come from that. But remember, people in hell want ice water. There's just some things that aren't going to happen. And, <laughs> and I think you have to be practical. And yeah. uh, even we, we're talking about Walt Disney. I think he was a practical visionary. Okay. He, and what I mean by practical was... He, his vision, you know, he's like, well, I can buy 160 acres over here in Anaheim and build my little amusement park, and and there and people can come enjoy the the practical application of my vision for a day. Yeah. And and what they take from that, you know, and if you put that out on the macrocosm, you know, um, people can come away from their exposure to the visionary's practical application of their ideal and come away with something that changes them so that they become, you know, a better person inside, a better citizen of their community or a better citizen of the world. But that doesn't mean we have to force everybody to get into lockstep. Now, that's true. I don't agree with the forcing, but there does seem to be a duality to almost everything. I think it's kind of built in, but there, you know, you have people in the same camp with the same philosophy saying, uh, you know, we are all one, which is a nice uh, idea. And then they also say uh, true change comes from within. So, you know, you're talking about you need to work on yourself on an individual level and it will radiate out, which is a popular idea and one that I'd probably agree with. Um, but then also you're you know, not we are change. all one. People aren't going to change the world by going out there to change the world. Right. People will change the world by changing themselves and then being an example and the only others. thing I don't like about the, uh, you know, some libertarian or conservative or individual uh, approach is it just seems, uh, while it does seem to be the most free, the most freeing, um, but it also it also seems a bit cold, and that's the angle that uh that that bothers me about it. That's the chip on my shoulder. Could that be conditioning? Could that be that you know you could merely con- to believe that? That definitely could. There's many layers to uh, to this manipulation, and I'm not immune to any of them. Um, but I'm constantly trying to figure out yeah. where the line is drawn, and I don't deny that it could be manipulation from my young and impressionable stoner inter- mind. Maybe what you're interpreting as cold 
is actually just really a faith in your ability to handle something that you think, you know, and I'm speaking, you know, in examples here, speaking hypothetically, you got a situation where, oh, my gosh, I'm this, I'm I'm overwhelmed, blah, 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 and and an individualist would say, well, you know, I'll give you a hand to get your uh, butt up back on your feet and uh, press on. Why? Because I have the faith that you have the wherewithal inside you to be able to solve this problem and get through it. And where you need a hand, I'll give you a hand. Um, but the, the individualist, the libertarian, um, says, you know, hey, I'll, I'll help you up, but I, I'm not going to carry you the whole way because it's not good for you. It's, you will get so much more out of your struggles. And this goes back to why I think the world is exactly what it's supposed to be. What you get out of you – see, here's the deal. Here's the conditioning that is wrong in, in, the, in our times mm-hmm. is the idea that the world is supposed to be fair that we can engineer a world, an environment, a society where, you know, oh, there is no struggle. Well, what a bunch of damn fools. I mean, the struggle is part of human existence. It's part of how you ad- advance your soul. It's, it's part of how you become a whole being and, and experience the, the fullness of what life is. I do think, I do see that struggle creates strength, and uh, it's almost a necessary part of that strength uh, creation. But this pull yourself up by your bootstraps attitude is being preached by a corporatocracy that is at the very same time undermining our ability to do that with lower wages, stealing pensions. Um, so it's all empty in a way in today's world. At least that's my uh, my view of it. I, and I would argue that's your conditioning because there are you know governments who claim to be helping those very same victims, they're not doing anything better by making welfare and, and the, uh, the dependency state um, more easily uh, available. People just say, well, why should I bust my ass to improve my lot when I can get up to the equivalent of $40,000 a year on food stamps and all this other stuff? I'll just, I'll just kick back and you know, collect my stuff um, from uh, the government and they, they don't advance that way either. So here's the thing. Both sides do nefarious things, right? Right. And Agreed. it's hard for some people to know what's the good guys, what's the bad guys. And I argue that there's bad on both sides. And that's why it's to the individual. If you want to really know what's going on, if you want to be able to see the, the, the good guys and the bad guys and see who's doing the nefarious stuff, you owe it to yourself to enlighten yourself, and that's why, bringing it back to this, the more time, the more time you spend enlightening yourself on that esoteric level, the more you're going to be able to see things for what they are. And believe me, I have my things that I'm critical about in the capitalist world, but here's what life has convinced me of, that like it or not, for all its imperfections, the free market and commerce and trade – these things that are in capitalism, Mm -hmm. these have been far better for humanity on the good things than the other way has ever been. And if you really look at history, honest history, you'll see that that, that, that's true. Now, does that mean, you know, people take advantage of it? Of course they do. This is why we have, you know, laws and this is why we have punishments. And, you know, when somebody breaks the rules, you you know, you punish them for breaking the rules, but you don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. You know, we, you go to a hospital, right? A hospital does great things. Well, you have a couple of doctors there that are doing rotten things. You don't, you don't outlaw hospitals just because a couple of rotten doctors. You, you take the license away from those doctors, and you never let them practice medicine again. But you don't close the hospital down. Right, yeah, that's fair. People see the evils. They see some bad eggs doing stuff in business, so they want to shut down capitalism. They want to tear it all down. Well, that, that's foolish, to put it in a word. And um, this is all part of the Enlightenment thing. You know, you, you get out there, you start looking for the, the, the big truths and understanding, you know, the, the, these esoteric things, and the, the everyday things will even become more clear to you. Um, and, and that's really why I espouse the path of individual enlightenment, because each person owes it to themselves. You're shortchanging yourself 
if you don't pursue this. And, you know, the fact that, you know, like you're willing, you know, you're asking me, hey, where can I go to, you know, that's, see, that's the first step. You're someone who's, who's smart enough and realize, hey, you know, I want some of that. I want to know this stuff. And I'm glad to tell you, hey, go here, go there. You know, be open to it, be for it, but be open to it because it, it's there for the taking and you owe it to yourself to, uh, to do it, you know. And you may not come away with the same exact spin, you know, that, that I do, and that's okay. Right. That's okay. Well, hey, you know, we're getting towards the end of the show here. I mean, it's been a fascinating conversation. Um, you know, I'm, I've always been interested in, uh, in some of the mechanisms or the tools that uh, create situations of power, which you could say this might fall into that category, even though it wasn't a, uh, an evil thing. It definitely probably contributed to the success of Disneyland. And it's just a, it's a really interesting topic I really hadn't heard discussed anywhere else. I'm glad you wrote the book. I'm glad you uh, came on the show today. Oh, well, thanks. I appreciate, you know, getting the chance to talk about it. And I hope we didn't meander off topic too much. But, no. um, um, you know, it's, it's a very interesting book. And I think your, your listeners will, uh, will enjoy it. And, it. and it's cheap, too. <laughs> yeah, I absolutely encourage anyone to get it. There's a Kindle version, which definitely cuts down on costs and, uh, you know, makes it a little easier to get. But uh, let people know before we go, what other projects are you working on? What do you got going on now in the future? Um, well, if they like, I would recommend they start with the Disneyland book um, uh, before they would read the other book that I uh, published last year called M titled Empire of the Wheel which uh, w was a, a result of after doing the Disneyland book, I, can, I wanted to research the, the ley lines that intersect in Disneyland and spread out through Southern California, and that led me to the information in Empire of the Wheel, which is a much uh, darker, bigger book. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and uh, I am researching what would be what what could be the second book but i'm not sure yet if i'm going to write that because i'm i'm discovering things i'm not sure i want to share and um so I, so i'm kind of neck deep in in that research i'm also um making a film i did a film titled hell's bell a 46 minute silent short which should be available on amazon streaming very soon and of course a dvd nice. I'm in the middle of putting together the DVD for that. Again, it's titled Hell's Bells. It's a silent movie set in 1929, kind of a comic horror film. Nice. And um, presently I'm shooting a horror film called uh, titled Chthonic, which is a sound film, a feature length. This one will be about 90 minutes. And it is very much, if you like the topics we talked about today or, or didn't get to in great detail, the, the alchemical and the esoteric and arcane stuff, it's a, it's a film about that. And um, and identity, personal identity, in some cases, gender identity, mm -hmm. um, trans some kind of thing. So wow. uh, just doing that, that's what I'm up to. Very awesome. Well, Walter, it was a real pleasure. Um, you know, great chat. Hopefully someday we can get together again, maybe talk about Empire of the Wheel, um, get a little deeper into it. Well, maybe I can go down to – I'm down in San Diego a lot. I could probably show you some spots sometime too. So. Absolutely, definitely. Um, we'd love to see that happen. You know, well, let me know when you're down here. hope we can talk again. Um, I know you got many more interesting works and life stories we didn't get to bring up, but uh, you got any last words for the people? Um, you know, just get out 